All right. We back at it. We ripping. You know what it is, man. Hold up. All caps podcast episode seven. Oh, shit. Actually, I don't know what episode we're on. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Let me redo this real quick. All right. Let's just put a line across the episode number. Real shit. We got it. We got it. Uh, it's your boy, Ak. We back out here again. We got Murph in the building. What up, boy? What up? Uh, we don't play here. We got a guest. We got a best. We got a. Who's that Pokemon? It's Daniel Shackman. <laughs> yeah, we got we got the mastermind herself, the founder of the fifteen seventeen fund. Uh, you know, she's helping out fund dropouts, unconventional founders, and you know whatever you imagine those sci fi geniuses, they funded it. Uh, so she's built a legendary, she's built with the legendary Peter Thiel from the PayPal mafia. So she ain't playing around, uh, the Thiel foundation. Uh, and today we got a wholesome episode for y'all. She, uh, she wasn't always in the venture capital world and she's seen what it's like to have your chip on your shoulder and you fight for the right to pull your money. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about, uh, Untraditional routes of education. Uh, not everything is supposed to be a startup. Imposter syndrome. How do you find what you're obsessed with? And uh, did you about to put y'all on some game for some resources? And uh, we just gonna have fun with this. So we are gonna be fast, efficient, quick with this one because we wanna be respectful all the time. And uh, we gonna go crazy. Yeah, yeah. So Danielle, tell the people where your hometown is. We'd like to know where you grew up. Just gives us a better idea where you're from. And then how did how did you get here? How did you get here and why the hell are you talking to me in Auk right now today? Oh, amazing, amazing. Well, my hometown in this moment is Oakland, California. So shout out to Oakland. Yeah. But I grew up in New England. I grew up out uh, in a city outside Boston, uh, really a town called Needham, Massachusetts. Um, and I always, there's this phrase, once a New Englander, always a New Englander. And I always mm-hmm. thought that that would be me. And then when I was 20 years old, uh, like 23 years old, I made the jump to move 3,000 miles away to California, which really changed everything. Yeah. And uh, and now I can't leave California. I, I attempted to leave a couple of years ago. I was going to go to Colorado, which is a wonderful, amazing place. But it was the winter and I visited it a few times and I was like, I can't do this. I was like, it's too cold. There's snow on the ground. I don't want to learn to drive in the snow again. Like, oh my gosh. So- <laughs> I, can't, I can't do snow. I can't do no- like, I, I always, I'm such a bad driver just to start off with. And then me add snow, <laughs> uh, I'd be, I'd be scary. Can you parallel park? I can parallel park just cause you know, we're we out in say, Seattle. You gotta know how to parallel park. I'm really good at parallel parking. Like people have commented at how good I am at this. I, I sometimes will tell people, I'll be like, I'll teach you to parallel park. <laughs> like, Dude, I told my mom when I first was doing my driver's license, I was like, ain't nobody to parallel parks anymore. We all got parking spots. Yeah, you know, that's not true. I don't know where I got that idea from. My mom still brings it up to me till this day. Oh, I, I told her it's for old people. That's what I said. By the way, Ahmed, I'm loving the braids. Have we talked about this. Yeah, yeah the no. braids. Ak looks Those good. Are, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Look, it I don't know really if you can good. see it. For people that are listening, oh, you can't God. see it, but it's all like this wavy <laughs> texture. I wanna How long did it take? Oh, 35 minutes. Like uh That's it. Yeah, it was super, super quick. And I, do you know who Drake is? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Yes. okay. I don't wanna be like a this <laughs> damn. I, I feel am bad. Are stupid, but not <laughs> All right, so I went to a golf tournament uh last weekend and pretty much i was walking and every time i'd walk i'd get champagne poppy drake drake is that you and i'm like i'm looking around i'm like i i'm flattered that you guys say that i look like him but i there's no way i i get that i'm just like (laughs) i'm looking around i'm like uh who are they talking to no no you gotta own that you gotta be like yeah that's me (laughs) got you got you but um but yeah to go back and, and answer one of those first questions, like, you know, moving out to California, really, I, I think it's not just, I mean, California is a very special place, but I think um, one of the themes that is really important to me is questioning one's self-concept and stretching your comfort zone. And for me, moving to California was this huge stretch. It was very different culture. When I first moved to California, I moved to Southern California mm-hmm. and being a, uh, being a young lady from you know the Boston area, moving out to SoCal <laughs> in 2003, uh, you would open up these like magazines that were like sort of like the I don't know, just like the city magazines and stuff. 
you know, in Boston, everything's like Red Sox and stuff like that. Yeah. In SoCal, plastic surgery. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what is this? Where am I? Like, this is crazy. Um, and just the, and I also noticed the biggest thing I noticed, which was so fascinating, because you don't, um, the things you're used to, you don't know what you're getting used to when you're getting used to it. So it's like a fish mm. in water. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there's something for me at least, and I think it's still kind of like this, but you know, if people are free to disagree, but where I was growing up in the Boston area, a lot of the conversation is about the past. Boston and New England are very rooted in the past and history. And I love that. Like, mm -hmm. it's really, really lovely. But what I noticed when I moved to California was everything was about the future. Hey, what are we doing five years from now? And how are we going to make a difference in something? And it was like very, it was a very different way of thinking. And when I was on the East Coast, it was more like sort of complaining about things that had happened in the past is kind of more of the normal, like cultural conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it was like this huge game changer to go from a place where the conversation was about the past to a place where the conversation was about the future. Um, and I think that really like gave me a sense of that you could be doing things that were futuristic, which is kind of interesting on the investment side. Cause I'm always thinking about, you know, you know, founders come to us with all kinds of ideas and it's like, yeah, they're painting me this picture of the future of something that could be. And if I had stuck with my, like, you know, I always say I'm East coast on the inside and West coast on the outside. <laughs> um, but if I had stuck with my hundred percent East coast self, I probably would be like, well, you know, is that really going to happen? Yeah, and more yeah. skeptical and more like, well, we're not going to get there. And, but California really brought out the like, well, yeah, why not? Like, why not do that crazy thing in the future? Or why not even just try? Um, and, uh, so I think, I think place can have a really big influence on us. And I think putting yourself it, around different people, different ecosystems. Uh, you know, I was just talking to a student yesterday. It's a student that I've known for since he was a, a high schooler. <laughs> and uh, I kind of yelled at him yesterday because he, <laughs> he's going to Waterloo and he was sort of complaining about how he's not learning enough. And I'm like, sounds to me like you're not taking hard enough classes. Mm. And he was like, oh, well, um, eh, eh. <laughs> and I was like, dude, like you're only like, if you're going to be in school, like you have to maximize your time there. And if you're not maximizing it by pushing yourself and questioning yourself concept, then like you're missing the boat. Yeah. And I feel the same way about like wherever you are or who you hang out with, like that you've got to be, um, really thinking about like, Hey, you know, we get one shot, right? Like yeah. I don't, I don't get to do redo on life. Um, and so, so yeah, just the place you're at, uh, has a profound effect on you. No, you gotta, you gotta push yourself. Like I always tell, this is like my life philosophy is like pushing yourself into that uncomfortable situation because if you're not, if you're comfortable all the time, you're not growing. Like you gotta just like, that's like, for me, like, that's like, that's why I want to go build. I want to go do stuff. I want to go explore. Cause I'm like, I feel so stupid. You know, when I like do, um, like when I do like, you know, design work and stuff like that, I'm not the smartest one in the room, but I'm, I'm learning so much. And it's almost like, okay, yeah. I'm putting myself in this uncomfortable yeah. situation, but this yep. uncomfortability is making me a better person. And I just, I'm growing mm -hmm. everything. So I, I li completely agree. And I wanted to pinpoint one question. So we see all over 1517 and the origin name of 1517 has historical origin. You were talking about this balance between history and future. I mean, how, how do you balance those two uh, when yep. you're kind of like going about yes. uh, putting efforts into, you know, these, these young, brilliant individuals, but also thinking about, okay, we got the fund in mind. We got, what are some pattern yep. recognitions? How do you balance yep. between being a history geek, but also a futurist? Oh, wow. That is, damn. That's probably like one of the best questions I think. I've ever <laughs> well, the way I'm going to answer this is probably in a way where you're like, I didn't know that's where that would go. So I am, uh, so my colleague hates it when I call him this. So I'm going to call him his history buff. Um, and I had a feeling, I had a feeling one of you guys are a history buff. I had a feeling. It's not me. I'm like, I was not paying attention in history. People uh -huh. were like, oh, I love watching. Like, I do love watching documentaries, uh, but yeah, I never, yeah, people who are like, oh yeah, we're going, I'm really into World War One. I'm like, I just don't get it. Um, but my, my colleague is really big into history, loves it. And 
one day when we were still at the Teal Foundation, uh, running the Teal Fellowship Program. And for anyone who's listening who doesn't know that, that program still exists today. And what it does is it gives young people the opportunity uh, to work on a project of their choosing with $100,000 as a grant. Uh, we started this program 14 years ago, and at the time it was heretical. Uh, this idea that you might pay a young person to work on their own project instead of going to college or having full-time employment elsewhere. Um, so we were working there. We shared an office. Uh, I'll paint the picture for you. Uh, the office, you know, it's it, it must have been like 10 feet by 10 feet, you know, maybe like 100 square feet. Kind of looks like a dorm room. We had posters up on, on. I always love, I'm like a so to your point about history, I am sentimental. Mm -hmm. um, so I had pictures of all the different people we've worked with, different young people I've worked with have like made uh, me art and things like that. In fact, actually th that right there is Ooh. a painting that one of our founders made. It's the Golden Gate Bridge. It's the bridge, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, it's one of those, oh, and we had a couch in the office, we had a ukulele. So we would take these music breaks and be like, we need, we need to think different. Let's like play some ukulele and like sing and hang out. We were definitely, I think, the most positive corner uh, of the teal offices. People wondered, like, what, like, why are those people having so much fun? Um, and we were having fun, but we also wanted to do more than what we were doing there. Because as generous as the foundation is, it's been about 20 young people per year for 14 years now. And we were there for the first five years. And me and my colleagues said, you know, we think we can really expand on this um, and you know, do more for more young people. So we decided to start 1517, which is our venture fund, which we sometimes call a fellowship 2.0. Mm. And uh, so, you know, I painted the picture of the office. So I walk into our office, Michael, like a madman is writing 1517 all over a piece of paper, like, <laughs> like, you know, like hundreds of times. I was yeah. like, what is going on? And so I walk in and I was like, hey, dude, like possessed much? Like, what, how is your <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> He's like, no, I think this might be the name of our fund. And I was like, oh, okay, like, you know, tell me more. And he's like, you know, the year. And I was like, I was definitely not paying attention. <laughs> and it says, well, you know, the year 1517, when the Protestant Reformation happened, Martin Luther had his theses. You know, some, some people will joke today and say it was the first listicle. And, uh, and nailed it to the church door saying, and it was in protest to say, hey, you know, people shouldn't have to pay for a relationship mm -hmm. with God, basically. Like, you know, you shouldn't have to pay to get into the kingdom of heaven because that's what the church was doing. You know, that's some, how some of these big cathedrals yeah. were built was like, okay, like we're going to we're gonna say, hey, give me some money for this. Um, and so we say likewise that in today's society, there's another large institution, higher education, that tells people, hey, you have to pay a lot of money for this piece of paper uh, to be called an educated person. So we say it was bullshit then in the past and it's bullshit today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that really resonates with people and this idea of like, there have been large institutions over time that get too much power and, and sometimes the power comes corruption and that corruption can lead to really, um, you know, poor outcomes for individuals uh, and society and, you know, other institutions. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of that historical tie-in um, you know, so I, I would say, you know, my colleague, Michael, is definitely the historical tie yeah. on the team. I mean, he's just he's so deep in that space. Uh, he wrote a book called Paper Belts on Fire, and it has all these history references in it. And we were walking through uh, Hong Kong at one point, and he's writing about us being there. And he's using all these different historical references. And I was like, were you really thinking about this while we were walking through Hong Kong? And he just kind of. <laughs> He's like, yeah, definitely. And I'm like, what? Like, yeah, no, he's like, I'm scheming. I'm scheming. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I think, I think we think I, I, you know, he brings that perspective in a lot. And for me personally, where it comes in is that, you know, we're all kind of standing on the shoulders of giants where everything that we're doing today is because of the people who have come before. So there's like a lot of uh, like profound respect there for what other people have had to do. Um, so that, you know, we can move forward with progress in technology mm. today. Um, but yeah, it, you know, I, I, I do wish I knew more about history myself. <laughs> like, um, you know, someday I'll watch all those documentaries that I should have watched like 10, 20 years ago. <laughs> little, little AP, uh, 
AP World History Crash Course right there for anybody that wasn't paying attention in sophomore year whenever that happened. How about for you guys? Are you guys in history? <laughs> nah, not at all. <laughs> I, was- I mean, I just... I. I just appreciated, like, uh, we were checking out your Instagram and everything, and everything has, like, a historical reference there, and um, I was like, okay, like, clearly one of the, somebody at the 1517 Fund is a history well, book there. I'll give you, I'll give you another insight. So, uh, a very good friend of ours who was a Teal Fellowship finalist in the first batch mm-hmm. is, uh, uh, she's the one who runs our Twitter and our Instagram, and she mm-hmm. is a... She is a nerd's nerd. Like, oh my God. She knows about everything. And she, I call it, you know, she's a great spelunker. Uh, her name is Anna. Yeah, yeah. And she loves to go spelunking on crazy ass topics. And, you know, sometimes we have a chat that we have open that she'll say like, oh, this week I'm thinking about like, you know, that, that we'll go down this rabbit hole over here. And uh, she's so funny. She's always like checking with that. Us. Is that okay? I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, you don't have to ask permission. Like, just go do it. Um, but yeah, she is, uh, one of the most well-read researched people that I've ever met. Um, and so it's, uh, it's just so charming to, and she loves, she loves visuals and she loves art. Yeah, and so yeah. she's always finding interesting tie-ins. Um, and, and yeah, people are often like, who on earth is running your social <laughs> media? I'm like, the best person ever. Um, And, you know, she really runs it from her heart and a place of passion and not like, oh, here's how we're going to get all these views. It's more like we're just trying to be ourselves online. Thanks. Shout out to her. Shout out to her. I I like the Twitter. It's engaging. It's different. It's one of those scroll stoppers. I'm not going to lie. I've been, you know, I was like, Mm -hmm. I follow you guys. So with like uh, on Twitter, it's like when you're scrolling through all this like feed and it's just like all this motivational stuff. And then finally I get to see something new and it's like, okay, okay, that's fine. That's cool. I like yeah. that. I like, I like a scroll stopper. I've heard that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I haven't thought of our stuff as like that. That's the nice. The scroll stopper. Well, I want to come back and touch, touch upon kind of like your experiences growing up. I think this like really relates to a lot of students um, in a sense that, you know, when you were going into school and you were talking about going into topics such, I believe it was neuroscience when you were talking to me about it. Um, and you felt this like kind of feeling of pressure, like, do I want to go here? Do I need to go to school? How did you deal with that? And how did you deal with like the balance of like, okay, I'm here to be curious and learn, but I also maybe want to go do something in the real world. And, you know, where does that balance come of finding what you're obsessed with? And if you don't know, where can you go find that? Yeah. Wow. Great questions. Um, so yeah, growing up, let's see, you know, I'll never forget. I, I got into the school that I wanted to go to, which was this all women's school called Simmons, uh, which is right outside Boston. And I remember there's, there's something there's thinking about what you think you will do. Um, or what you want. And then there's the actual lived experience of it. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed how often that, and we saw this with the Teal Fellowship too. Sometimes Teal Fellows would get a Teal Fellowship and they'd be like, oh my God, now that I actually have it, now I really need to think about what I'm going to do with it. Not just the thing I thought I would do with it. And it was kind of the same way for me getting into college where I remember opening up this acceptance packet and saying out loud gosh, I don't know if I want to go. And it came with mostly a full ride and everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, uh, I grew up in, you know, a single parent household, you know, my dad was around, but you know, my, my mom was the the primary raiser, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and you know, my, my family, you know, we're, we're all really hard workers, but I don't come from a family of academics. You know, I was going to be the first person, uh, you know, one of the first people in, well, the first person in my direct family to go to undergrad, <laughs> and even within the extended family, I was going to be one of the first to like, you know, go get a degree and things like that. And so when I said this out loud of like, I'm not sure if I want to go, I remember my mom, like just, she got like right up here in my face <laughs> and she was, and, and her words were women fought for you to be able to go yeah. to school. You're going to school. And I was like, like same reaction okay. from my mom, but she was when I told her I didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> oh yeah. No, totally. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, and it's funny because like when I think about it, well, you know, when I think about it now, it's like, yes, women did fight for the choice to do that. They didn't fight for anyone to have to do the thing, but yeah, they did yeah. fight for people. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I was not going to argue that with my mom when I was 18 uh -huh. years old. And <laughs> uh, so I ended up, you know, enrolling in undergrad. And I, I still remember these different times where one thing that was really interesting is, so when I went to school, it was, uh, undergrad was much more freeing than it is now. Uh, and I and I got to see the shift actually happen because when I was there, if you wanted to do a grad school class, all you had to do was go talk to that professor and like they'd be like, oh, sure. Yeah, come be in this class. No big deal. Um, when I was leaving school and this was in 2002, I noticed the freshman class. There were all these gen eds that got put in like, oh, you have to do this and you have to do that. And when I went it felt really freeing. Like this was the first time in my educational career where I could just pick what I wanted. And I remember talking to a professor and I was like, can I just do like a scholarly women's major and do a little bit of everything? And he said, no, he was like, no, in the job market, you have to yeah. like be able to say that you're a specific thing now, which is fascinating because knowing what I know now, I'm like, would have been fine with the scholarly women's major. And now this idea of like sort of independent study, and creating your own major it's like totally normal now but you know i was very much told like you can't do that um so i ended up focusing on neuropsych um i i you know i i did this thing where you know at the time it's just interesting um at the time there wasn't this concept of like oh every summer go do an internship and beef up your resume. It was just kind of like get through school and then see what job you get. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember thinking like, I want to get experience. And I looked up the hospital that was next door to my school, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And they had a neurology department. And I looked at this woman's research and I thought it was really interesting. Um, and so I just decided like with no appointment or anything, I would just walk into the neurology department and I walked into the neurology department and this woman named Lorna is the administrative staff. And she's, she's, as my dad would say, a hot ticket. That's <laughs> what my dad would say. Um, and she's like, Hey, like, you know, who are you? Do you have an appointment? And I was like, no, like I'm just a student from across the street, but I'd love to talk to Dr. Margaret O'Connor um, because I think this work is really interesting. And I'd, I'd like, like to shadow sometime. And she's like, what? <laughs> like, who are you? What are you doing here? And I was like, I'll just wait. Like, if Dr. Margaret O'Connor has any time at all today, like, I'll just sit in the waiting room and she can come say hi. And eventually, hours later, uh, Dr. O'Connor comes out and she's like, hi, who are you? And I was like, I'm just a student. Like, I just really want to shadow. I just want to see what you're doing here. So she said yes. Um, and so sometimes just showing up someplace and putting yourself out there and not, you know, I wasn't asking for permission. They, ha yeah. they had never yeah. done an undergrad internship ever. And which is hilarious. I remember she told me, she said, we don't, and this is after I had been shadowing for maybe a month. She says, you know, we've never done an undergrad internship because usually undergrads don't know how to dress for the role. People come in here mm -hmm. looking like they're going to a concert on a Saturday and you know, this is a hospital. And yeah. I always you know, very conservatively and at the hospital was very, you know, just buttoned up and she's like, Oh, like, you're great. Like, you know, you know how to just kind of slot in. And I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, sometimes you got to dress for the part. Um, but, um, but that got me down the neurology path. Uh, and I worked there for a number of years. Uh, and then actually I ended up being the one to train a bunch of grad students, which was really charming because yeah. I was the youngest person in the department. Um, I learned a lot about even office politics because I remember there were these schisms between the admin staff and the doctors because, you know, doctors are like, I'm hot shit and the admin <laughs> yeah. or thing. And so Lorna, I hope Lorna, you know, I haven't thought about Lorna in a long time. I wonder what she's up to these <laughs> days. Really sweet lady. But she'd be like, oh, and she's fun. she had a nickname for me. She called me Baby Bird. She'd be like, Baby Bird, come here. And I'd be like, oh, <laughs> Hey, Lorna, how's it going? And baby bird, you go talk to the doctor about this thing. And then she made me be the messenger going back and forth yeah. between the doctors and the admin staff. And so I learned a lot about office politics. It was interesting. But, um, but I learned a ton there. But what I also learned over time was that 
as much as I loved being in that environment, I figured out it wasn't the thing that I wanted to do forever. Like I noticed after I finished school and I was still working there and also working in a research department, um, that I was really good at it, but I wasn't passionate about yeah. it. It wasn't like I was reading neurology books in my spare time or anything like that. And I, I had actually signed up to go to grad school. I got into grad school. I was going to be the first person in my family, you know, to potentially get a PhD and all this stuff. And then I jumped off the train before I even enrolled in school and said, like, you know, if I remember telling myself, like, if growing up means putting your feet on the floor and like not enjoying what you're going to do now i'm a real estate and a capitalist mm -hmm. i'm not one of these like do what you love i'm like like yes do what you love but you got to make some money yeah like it's got it's got to be both you got <laughs> you to gotta figure out how to support yourself um and i and i figured out that you know getting up and and what i also learned in the research department was that research was not what i thought it was i thought research was like working with patients and yeah. you know being able to see like a light bulb go off and like bless researchers because the delayed gratification you have to have to be a researcher is super <laughs> intense. And I remember I worked in a windowless room with two other, uh, two other hospital techs and my job was mostly faxing paperwork to NIH. And I was like, this sucks. <laughs> like, this is not what I thought research was. Um, and you know, so it's, it's really just kind of dry work. And I figured out like, okay, this is not for me. So I got off the educational path at that point and, and also got off the neurology path because I wanted to, I wanted to see more of this like light bulb go off for people. And for me, that was in teaching. Yeah. Uh, and I had, a, I had been a tutor from the time I was even in high school. I just always loved teaching. And so I, I jumped off the neurology train and started a tutoring business and said like, you know, I, I love watching that like aha moment. Um, and even, you know, when I was in office hours at UW and stuff like that, where we met, it's like, yeah. you know, there's a lot of parallels with what I do now, where I get to watch that light bulb go off for people, um, you know, and then they go run off and do something with it and super exciting for me. So I know that was a long story, no, um, but I wanted to flesh that out a little bit for you guys. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta give the whole background. Yeah, definitely. And from tutoring, and you can dive into this more. You founded your own school, Innovations Academy in San Diego. And this, the specialized thing about that school is I was project and student led um, learning based, I guess, if I summarize that well. And I'm curious, in a in public university like UW, you don't normally get into, into those type of classes until junior and senior year. And right. I think those are the, those are the most valuable classes. Ox taking one of them right now. We <laughs> yeah. have this entrepreneurship class. We have this entrepreneurship class and it's real world. It's scrappy as hell. You got to get out there and sell. You can't build a software company in the class, but like it's a lot of product consumer based yeah. projects and you get, you just get out there and learn how to sell basically, which is yeah. awesome. Cool. Um, but, but what would sucks that you had to wait till like year three yeah. and this is what i've noticed it's like when yeah. i was in school it used to be very different where it's like if you wanted to take that like higher level class you just went and talked to the professor and they were like sure but there seems to be this incentive i think for school to now dictate i mean it's a lot more juvenile of like we're gonna tell you what you have to do first and college didn't used to be that way i mean with those mm -hmm. strict structures how do we not kill our curiosity as youngins you know like i feel like it's so because you know the pressures of everyone at least around me and Murph being like oh you know it, to get into the startup world the vc world is so hard oh why don't you go here why don't you go here how do we not kill our curiosity while we're young i think it's a good question i mean i think first of all noticing like that there are systems out there that like its whole job is to kind of be a wet blanket or pour water on that is like really, really huge. Um, and the, the second I think is to um, continue the things that you are curious and passionate about and just, you know, be like, all right, fuck it. Like, this is what, <laughs> this is what I need to do. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. Cause like, I, yeah, I, I think that human beings are born naturally curious. Like, I don't think, you know, when people are like, Oh, how do we, how do we make people motivated? I'm like, you don't make somebody motivated. That's almost like the antithesis of motivation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll never forget, there was this, there was this tweet 
uh, over the pandemic. It was like early on and this woman was saying something like, my brother is so bored, he's just playing guitar all day. And I was like, that's not boredom, that's motivation. Like, and so we tend to ascribe things that we think are not value creation things as like, oh, that's what you do when you're bored. Um, and only like the serious stuff, like that could become a job that you do because you have to, uh, seems to be like more valuable in the adult world. Yeah. But there's something where, you know, I mean, any small child that you watch, like they get deeply, uh, their attention goes deeply into things. Yeah. And I think our job in systems should be to not crush that, but we're really, really, really good, um, you know, at, at crushing that. And so I think that just that noticing that you mentioned earlier of like, yeah, there are a lot of driving forces that are going to take you away from the things where you most deeply want to go is a really good first step as an individual to have that agency to say like, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think this might be a good time for you to um, give some resources, I guess, to our listeners of how, because there there are resources out there, but it may be hard to find, especially when you're in an environment, like we were talking about earlier, like your environment is a leading factor of how you make decisions kind of and what you choose to do on a day-to-day, -day, on yeah. a yearly career-wise basis. So yeah. what are some resources that you may know of within your own network and maybe outside that you would recommend to students? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things is that I think a lot of people are really looking for permission. They're looking for someone out, someone or something outside of them to say, you know what, you're great, or the things you love are great and are worthwhile. Um, and it's hard to find those things. So one thing is sometimes even just finding those personal mentors in our life, like the people who are going to really uphold, like, hey, what do you want to do and who do you want to become? Like, if you have that kind of person in your life, um, like hold on to that number one. Um, and if you don't have that kind of person in your life, trying to find that kind of person, you know, sometimes those are teachers too, like the people who see something in us that we don't even see yet. So I would say, hold those people close and try to find those as much as possible. Um, and then on the resource side, you know, at 1517, we have some things that, uh, we used to do this. One is our grant program. We have a grant program called the Medici project. And I sometimes call the Medici project a fairy godmother moment <laughs> where I meet someone on a campus and I just think like, gosh, like this person has like this like energy and enthusiasm for something. And I want to know how some resources will help them. Because I think for young people, they're used to being in this rat race of winning prizes against each other, like against your own cohort. What you're not used to, though, is someone saying, cool, you did this stuff in the past, you know, that's fine. Tell me what you, you know, back to the California conversation, what do you want to do in your future? And how might something like a thousand dollars help you with that? Um, and it's been really fun for us. Like we've given out grants to young people who have started companies with the money. We've given grants out to people who have, um, you know, started like projects. Like we use the word projects a lot because we are not wedded to like where it goes. Mm -hmm. um, I gave a grant to someone once who wanted to build a unicycle he was just like, I really want to build a yeah. unicycle. I really want you to build a unicycle. Like, <laughs> um, you know, so that's like, obviously like not startup oriented, but we want to give people the ability to build and make and really learn something that they can't without those resources. So that's one. Um, I also really love the Emergent Ventures grant program. You know, it sounds sort of like an investment because it's got that word ventures in there, but it's a grant. Uh, I think the smallest grant they do is 5,000 and, you know, they, they go quite large from there. Um, and the application cycle is really quick. I think most people hear back within two weeks. Um, and so programs like that, where they're going to give you some form of a resource to move forward with something you want to try out or a project, um, I think can be really, really powerful. Um, and there's a bunch of these different programs and I'll send you guys a, a link to, you know, it's just a spreadsheet that we have. Of, yeah. like, here's a bunch. Of we'll drop it. Programs. We'll drop it. Share everyone. Yeah, drop the yeah. knowledge bomb on everyone that you give us. Well, just, yeah, I think it's <laughs> one of those things where, yeah, if you don't know these things exist, then you don't even know to look for them. I mean, and I want to, I want you to like, we, we talked about this earlier, just got like off recording. Like, why is it important that like not every, cause I feel like there's this pressure, you know, with a lot of people like, Oh, I have to make that next Figma, the next Ethereum, you know, where, you know, sure. doing all these kind of like, Oh, I gotta be this next startup. Why is it important to just kind of like almost just have fun and just build side projects? Yeah. 
Yep. Well, I can tell you from experience of working with, you know, Dylan from Figma and Vitalik from Ethereum that like the thing that got them, or at least one of the things that got them to where they are today is being super curious and just building projects mm -hmm. and just starting with things and seeing what would happen and um, giving themselves permission to do that. And so I, I do think it's a, an awfully high bar to say like, I want to be the next, whatever that big thing yeah. is. And I think it's really good to have aspirations and goals like that. But I think even more so it's important to say like, all right, I'm going to get my hands dirty. Like I'm just going to start making and doing, um, because that skill set of being able to create, uh, in the world is very, very special. It, it, um, it's funny, especially when I meet people who can like really build like physical products, like hardware and things like that. I'm like, oh my God, you are, like, you're moving atoms around. Like, how does that work? You know, yeah. people who are in biotech, it's like, wow, okay, you're doing cellular shit. Like that, this is kind of an, impressive. But I think it can start way earlier than that. Like it can just be like, hey, like, you know, this weekend I'm going to sit down and do a project. I think sometimes people think, oh, I have to work on this huge idea. Um, you know, one of our founders said, well, I was asking for some advice for high school students. And he's like, you know, like, just make anything. It could be, it could be that you make like a, a wooden bench, like, you know, anything yeah. because it gives you the confidence to then keep trying building more things and harder things and like gets you going. And most people get stopped up at the first one. And then it becomes this dream of like, oh, for 10 years, I've said I would do X and like, oh, and I haven't done it. But it's like, that confidence from making will serve you when you're going after those really big dreams of like, Hey, I want to, I want to create something that has like, you know, more impact than a weekend project or like who I am myself. Um, but it, it really does start with building. And it creates a whole new generation of thought. You know, when you're doing these kind of things, you now start to identify problems that you wouldn't have like before because you weren't actually in the weeds. That's really, yeah, that is really, really, really smart. And yeah, that, that also goes back to this idea of um, one thing we tell our founders and just the people we work with in general is that reality is the best teacher. Um, you know, like you might, you could think about something all day, but it's like, okay, put it into reality and you're, you're going to have experiential learning, um, which is a whole different ball game. And I want to I want to ask one last question before we go into flip the script on you uh, as a as a yeah. <laughs> uh, we I know that when you were first trying to start this fund and this is and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, there were people saying, oh, like this is like a cute little nonprofit or this is, you know, yeah. this is that. And a lot of I mean, people in general in this startup space or investor space were just kind of like, oh, that's cute. And I feel like a lot of students get that as well. Like a lot of students yeah. get that, yeah. oh, what you're doing over here, what you're that's building? Like oh, that's a cute, yeah. yeah, that's a cute little project. How did you be able to handle that and be able to yeah. get the get people to take you serious? Because I struggle yeah. with that a lot. I feel like coming from where I come from, a lot of times I'm I'm thinking like, man, am I really supposed to be here? Am I am I like am, am I really worth being? Is it worth being here? Like all these people are not even taking me serious, but I have so many of these great ideas that I just want to put out there. How can we make sure that the people in the game start seeing us as a real player? Especially when me and Ak go to like networking events, that happens a lot too. Just getting kind of belittled, which is part of the game, kind yeah. of humbling yourself, you know, making it, it motivates it motivates us, honestly. But yeah, how do you how do you put yourself out there like that? Well, that's where I think you have to give yourself permission. You're not going to make anybody else think any different. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like we face that a lot. And a funny story about this is it was like probably the first year of our fund. This was nine years ago. We went to this conference where at the conference they picked like nine different projects that would be workshopped and you'd have a booth and people could come up and like hear what you were doing and sort of workshop it with you. And 1517 got picked as a project. And so me and Michael are sitting at this conference and people keep coming up. Um, and, you know, these, you know, some of these people are like, I don't know, well-known um, creators, inventors, academics, like, you know, like some head honcho folks. And almost everybody who came up to our booth was like, oh, you're building a community of young people. You should be a nonprofit. And we were like, well, we're already incorporated. Like we're, we're making this fund. Like we made it because of our time at the foundation and literally everybody there was like, no, 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 no. You should do this as a nonprofit. This isn't going to work as a for-profit. And it was so frustrating because yeah. we were like, 
okay, not only do we not believe what you're saying, but we've already incorporated, like there's <laughs> like, we're, like we're already doing it. And we could not, we could not get people to accept that. Like, like there was already even a structure around this. And what's hilarious is this conference wrote to uh, me last year and was like, oh, we'd love to hear about outcomes from like when you guys got like sort of picked to be a project. And I was like, well, I'm really glad we didn't listen to anybody's advice because our fund, we have returned four X to our investors. Yes, so our sir. Put some respect, put some <laughs> respect on my name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad we didn't listen to anyone at your conference because everyone told us that we should be a nonprofit. And guess what? I would not be owning my own home right now if I had done that. Yeah. Like, Ooh, let's get a round of applause for that. Let's get a round of applause for that. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, is that like, people on the cusp you might change their mind you might yeah. be like oh okay i'm taking you seriously but like what i have to say about like going out there in the world and and like interfacing with people who don't get it is move on yeah like the people who are gonna get it are gonna be so much more they're gonna help you they're gonna motivate you like and maybe those people are few and far between but like it's better to spend your time with those folks than to like be at a networking event and like argue with someone for an hour about why you're legit. Yeah. Like that, like waste of time, game lost. Um, and so, you know, I do think that sometimes, you know, the proof is in the pudding and you can use that fuel of people not believing to be like, oh my gosh, actually, I am so like this. Um, if someone tells me I can't do something, I'm like, watch out. Like I'm going <laughs> to get you. I have a really funny, simple example of this where, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had an office for 1517, but we clearly didn't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I have a Honda Fit, small little car. And I told my colleague, Mike, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to bring my car and we're just going to pack up the office and get the hell out. And he's like, and he's like, we can't fit everything in your car. And I was like, <laughs> yes, we can. And he's like, no, you can't. And I was like, I am a Tetris master. <laughs> like, watch, watch me. And I have this great photo of, uh, I mean, we had shelves, we had chairs, like we had things that really we should not have been able to fit. And I not, you know, to give some, you know, credence to this. Yeah, it was difficult to pack the car, but I got it all packed. We have this big like 1517 sign in the back window of the car that someone had made for us. And I had like this little pile of stuff left. And he's like, okay, well, what are we going to do with this? I was like, sit your ass down. The car. And he sat down. <laughs> And I put it on his lap and I was like, this is where this goes. And then we drove away. So yeah, if someone tells me I can't do something, like I, I go crazy. <laughs> like, so use that I like feel. to your advantage. When people are like, oh, you can't do that or you can't do this. And you're like, I'll see you on the other side. Oh, like, you know, um, so the people the, like don't spend so much time with the people who are going to be the naysayers because they're, that is their constitution. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. someone could t come to them, you know, and be like, oh, I'm going to do this really amazing thing that is, you know, a great thing to have in the world. And they're going to be like, oh, no, you shouldn't do it because of these reasons. It's like that person's going to do that anyways. Now, someone who gives you some constructive feedback of like, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? What about this? What about that? Mm -hmm. It's like that person is engaging you in what you're doing. And I think that's helpful. Yeah. But I would say for the people who are just the naysayers, like move on, like at, at events and stuff like that, just be like, I'm good. Yeah, word. Okay. Okay. No, we appreciate that. I think a lot of people that, I mean, you dropped, that was, that was some, that was some fire stuff. Um, but wow. we're, we're running. We're Glad we did not become a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I, and we're, we're running out a little bit out of time. We want to be respectful of your time, but oh, we want to, we want to, we got to flip, flip the script. So what are we going right. to do? Let me, let me, let's do this. <laughs> we... <laughs> all right, I'm ready. I, I'm like getting a pen. I know yeah, I yeah, get a yeah, pen yeah. and paper, get a pen and paper. All right, all right. I'm, like, I'm ready. No, so, I got it. I'm like, okay. so pretty much what we're going to, we're going to give you a random topics and you're going to pitch us up a startup idea and we ain't not playing yeah. nice. We're, we're, we're going to be playing like the mean VC. I'm scared. <laughs> Uh, so pretty much we're all caps capital and we want and our theme uh, and every venture capital firm has a theme. So for everyone that's like still learning about this uh, space and uh, our theme is uh, you got to give us the craziest idea possible. Like we, we don't want we just want wild and uh, and we want you to pitch us and, and we'll determine if you get funded or not. And if you do, uh, I'm ready. We'll, we'll try to send you a little stuffed animal called caps. <laughs> I don't uh, I, I don't got it on me right now. I got to I got to order that little guy, <laughs> but we're going to give you we're going to give you that. 
Uh, so, Ryan, do you want to introduce the problem, the three technologies that we only invest in, and uh, and some of the rules that we set for her? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> our problem, we got a society of big frogs, human-like frogs. We're living in an alternate universe here. And they smart and they got cash now. They got an economy, uh, but yeah. they can't stop... They can't stop the with the hawks um, like, from messing around with their turf. Like the, they're on their turf. Like the animal. They like the animal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, so that for the technology, the king frog is our limited partner, short for LP. You know how we normally say that. <laughs> he's, he's the big boy that gives us the money we, to to invest into the to the people yeah. that we want or the technology. And we, we don't want to make him mad. We can't piss King Frog off or it's off with our heads, you know? So our lives are on the line, Danielle. Our lives are on the line. Life right, or death, life or death. I'm feeling the pressure. Okay. And the three, the three technologies you have for this problem are video calling, <laughs> teleportation, and exoskeleton suits. So frogs are trying to protect themselves from the hawks and you have video calling one of one of the one of the technologies is video calling the other is teleportation and the third is exoskeleton suits and i have so we, to use all three of these technologies you can in the you can use all three or you can use one to mix of them he the king mm -hmm. frog just wants to see these technologies used because that's what he's most interested in. and he wants the next frog corn not a unicorn he wants a frog corn and so <laughs> amazing and so you and then okay hold on i have clarifying questions <laughs> skeleton suit all by itself hasn't solved this problem no the uh, king frog says that it's faulty and he needs other mix of technology with it okay got he it. says the <laughs> hawks will tear up the exoskeleton suit from the okay frog. so it's not strong <laughs> it's not strong enough. Right. and we and, okay, and so your company name has to have a frog based name or it's we're not funding it oh yeah come up with a company name <laughs> frog king frog don't play you don't play okay oh my god <laughs> this is so hard um yeah, I mean, what's coming to mind is like, okay, we ha we we're gonna need a material science play to make these exoskeletons stronger. Number one, but let me, I'm like, I needed a second here to be like, all right, how yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like picturing picturing a world with these like very big like humanoid frogs walking around, and the thing is, yeah, these hawks are flying by, and like they need to support keeping away from them. Um, I think of the I movie mean, Bugs Life when when doing this. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Let me let me think here. Putting you on the spot. Putting Daniel you know, on, the spot. So on the spot. Well, I mean, part of part of my brain is like going over like the physics of this universe. <laughs> because if you have teleportation. I love it. Like, I love it. Are we, okay, hold on. Let's back the teleportation up. Is the teleportation only within the current world? It's like, okay, we're in Frogland, and if we do teleportation, it's like you can get from the lake to over here, but it's not like time travel. No, it's not it's time travel. Like you enter a portal and you exit a portal, yeah. and it's in the same world. Yeah, they're like two portals in the same world, so they like might be able to portal from the ground to the sky, catch the hawks off guard. Oh, I'm not trying to give you. <laughs> <laughs> like, ooh, ooh, okay, yeah, I think. Okay, what I'm sort of putting together, I don't know quite how this works, but is that, yeah, the frogs have these exoskeletons that they can wear. There has to be, there have to be some material science changes to make these suits stronger, but redundancy within technology is often important. So the redundancy effect I want to add here is that, yeah, let's say like there's like a super massive hawk and it can like, you know, yeah. grab with its talons and be like, okay, sure, I'm going to just hold on to this exoskeleton, like carry you away. What I could see happening is something where there's something like sort of shield like about the exoskeleton where mm. it can open up one of these portals. And instead mm. of the frog, because like what you don't want to have to be doing with teleportation is be like, oh, I'm doing my king frog thing. And now I have to always be hopping into portals to get away. But what you could do is you could make something on the suit where like, if the suit itself doesn't protect you, it like opens up a teleportation portal and the hawk goes into Ooh. it. And it's <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh, yes, no, hold on. It's developing more. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, no, okay, okay. I'm gonna add in the video call. It's happening. Um, <laughs> so what happens is with the portal, it catches it catches the hawk, and the thing. Okay, wait, no, it's getting better. So the thing about because at first I was like, well, why wouldn't why wouldn't just the exoskeleton work? But the thing is, is that the exoskeleton and the teleportation work together because like you don't want to just be like oh that hawk didn't get me you want to put it somewhere yeah, yeah you yeah. want to get it out of there get it in the dungeon <laughs> yeah exactly so you have like you know some like basically like hawk zoo where that portal goes to so any hawk that attacks you if it gets close enough a portal opens up around you that you have engaged with the exoskeleton it pulls it into that and then there's a video feed from that like zoo place so you always have your eyes on like <laughs> how many hawks are in there um the king frog just like now, holding now, his stomach just laughing <laughs> now, the, now if the king were really smart what he would do is he would he would be like okay i'm gonna actually try to taunt the male hawks <laughs> and catch them first and like get them away so then like they can't breed more and like have more hawks and then you yeah know, yeah you know, have all problems but yeah that would be my idea is like an exoskeleton that has stronger materials on the outside but we have redundancy and also safety with some sort of teleportation shield that will like pop out that instead of sucking the frog somewhere it like sucks the hawk into it puts it into some like <laughs> hawk zoo somewhere where you can kind of keep track of them okay what do we call this thing we call this and it has has to have like an image. I can't believe you just put all of them together. I that is insane. And under like five minutes too. I, you guys gave me all the stuff. I just needed to be like, wait, how does this work? And my brain first went to like, oh, maybe the frog hops into a portal. And I was like, it would be a terrible life if your whole life was spent like escaping hawks. <laughs> I'm just thinking of frogs with like portal guns just shooting into the sky. <laughs> the portal gun that's kind of cool it's like snap you're like boom um i'm trying to think what do we call this like i i think it has to have the word like it has to have like amphibian in there um how about hold on i'm like i'm i'm, I'm trying some things out on paper uh hold on i want to look up i love i love uh <laughs> i love etymology um yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, i'm like looking up uh hold on I'm, I'm like, here you're go. doing hold it on, in the very on. smart way i would just be frog names <laughs> <laughs> no mm -mm, mm -mm. um oh yeah of course okay Ooh. of course um, uh, play on, on words okay so oh interesting I'm still in shock you could do that. I was never thinking that. Yeah, I'm we thought we got well, you. I mean, you know, Crazy <laughs> impressed. Crazy we're just, impressed. We're just putting it together. Yeah, you know, I'm like trying to, the the, word, the name part's going to be tough. It's like, yeah, Porta Suit doesn't sound so good. That sounds too much like <laughs> that sounds like a That sounds like a restaurant. <laughs> this is like not, not so good. Um, hmm. Porta Suit. Okay, hold on, hold on. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got a better idea. Um, let's see. Do they? Oh, hmm. I was just looking up like a hawk trap. Turns out there are hawk traps. I did not. I I'm didn't. learning something new today. I did not. Um, know hmm. Hmm. The na the name part that's going to be tough. That's going to be the hardest part. Part of me wants to go to something that's like like a like hawk capture, but something about the amphibian protection. Uh -huh. I'm not there. I'm not there yet on the name, but I've got. I've got my idea down. Okay. I mean, it's also, we'll you also that. threw in like a consumer entertainment aspect of watching the Hawks being <laughs> trapped. And it's just, That's you threw good. in all these yeah. different yeah. types oh, of. Yeah, it could be like Hunger Games. People <laughs> cheer. <laughs> it's just, oh, a, it's no. just an arena of just frogs. Just <laughs> yeah. a, we got another one. <laughs> I got another one. And maybe, oh, actually, you know, I could imagine on that sort of like Hunger Games side of things like the amphibians could try to taunt like the largest hawk they could because maybe you get bonus points for catching a particularly nasty hawk where it's like oh that one's like 10 pounds heavier than the other ones <laughs> like, yeah, cool. you gotta make this i feel like we just tv show <laughs> i feel like we just came up with like a scooby-doo scooby-doo <laughs> episode right there <laughs>
<laughs> oh my yeah, god! Yeah, no, absolutely. The well, and now, uh, yeah, uh, th there's a lot that could be uh, entered into like mid journey here, or uh, you know. Uh -huh. Now we get an AI into this. Yeah, we, we're, we're, yeah. We're, we're, that's, that's what's what's that's what's about when we in the startup game. We gotta throw an AI. We just called this frog <laughs> portal device dot AI. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's, you know, uh, it's not worth anything as AI at the end. Well, so. well let's, let's scheme up, Murph. Do you think she she deserves the investment in what? Does the fraud? Are you kidding? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 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 Uh, oh, my God. What? <laughs> All right. Oh my well, the frog, gosh. the frog king said uh, he's cool with it, but uh, his terms are uh, uh, only preferred stock. Uh, he wants double dipping. <laughs> so when you sell the company, he wants his money back and plus more. <laughs> he wants. He's uh, just being greedy. He's just being greedy. Yeah, I mean, he did I'll great. Whatever, I'll give him whatever terms he wants for this. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, we appreciate you so much. I know we were over time. Yeah, thank we you for thank entertaining you so us. So, there. Hold up, hold up. We just gotta. Thank you for all that. We gotta give you that a little wow. Uh, <laughs> you're the best, and thank you so much. And like, I, I just want to say, you are the most empathetic and fun person in the VC world that I've ever met. And I can't thank you enough for doing this for us. And we hope you had fun and you know teaching oh, everyone that. a little bit of everything. I know this was a little quick. It was a quick one, and we weren't able to dive deep. But if you guys want to learn more, I'll drop her Twitter. I'll drop everything or whatever social media she's on i'm gonna put it in the comments uh is there anything you want to shout out before we exit oh well if anyone ever wants to get in touch um find me on twitter d strackman or just email me danielle at 1517fun.com i love hearing from people um and uh and yeah we'll make sure to drop the grant link as well so that people can yep. find more resources all right Definitely. well we're gonna be wrapping up on this we appreciate you for your time and we'll catch all y'all next time peace Later.